I'm going to over-insulinize you. Got it? So this is the new Maya. She wakes up in the morning. She starts out the day eating 2,000 calories just like before. But now, because of the excess insulin I'm pumping her full of, 500 of those 2,000 calories, whoosh, straight to fat. Like what the IRS does to your paycheck. Whoosh, gone before you have a chance to spend it. Gone before you had a chance to burn it, Maya. Okay? You are now 500 calories heavier. If you got on the scale, you would weigh a seventh of a pound more. And I did it to you. Now, you ate 2,000, but you lost 500 to your fat. So how many calories do you have left to burn? 1,500. But your body wants to burn 2,000 because that's where it feels good. And how many calories you burn and how good you feel are synonymous. They are the same. They are identical. Things that make your energy expenditure go up make you feel good, like ephedrine's off the market, caffeine, exercise. Things that make your energy expenditure go down make you feel lousy, like hypothyroidism, starvation. So you only have 1,500 to burn, and your body wants to burn 2,000. So what do, we call your what do we call the state where your body has fewer calories than it wants to burn? It's called, I just said it, starvation. So how do you feel when you're starved? Crappy, tired, slothy, sit on the couch, don't want to do anything, don't want to exercise, maybe play video games, and of course hungry. So in a world of free access to food, which we all live in, what's Maya going to do? You know, eat back the 500, right? So now she's eating 2,500 instead of 2,000, except, haha, I'm still pumping her full of insulin. So there go another 100 off the top, whoosh, straight to fat. Now you're 600 calories heavier. You're only up to 1,900 to burn. So you still don't feel great. So you go to Dr. Bork and say, you know, every time I get on the scale, I weigh more, and I don't understand it. I don't even feel good. What's going on with me? And he says, look at your behaviors. You're a glutton and a sloth. And guess what? You are now. But it's not because you chose to. It's not because you want to. It's because you have to. It's a biochemical drive set up by the insulin I pumped you full of. Insulin makes you gain weight and makes you feel lousy. And if you don't believe me, just think back to last Thanksgiving. Okay? Everybody got it? It's all in there now? Good. So let's move on. So, this is a book that you may have heard of called Food Fight, written by Kelly Brownell, where he coined the term the toxic environment. Okay, and what he was talking about was modern eating and exercise conditions. So food, available 24 hours a day, right? You could, I mean, it doesn't matter what time of the day or night, you can get a pizza, right? Um, accessible as never before. Sold in places unrelated to eating. Whoever heard of having dinner at a gas station, you know? Unbelievably cheap, promoted heavily, and designed to taste really good, and we'll talk about that later. On the activity side, decreased walking and biking, little phys ed, screen time makes kids inactive. I'm not arguing that. The question is, is it that the screen time makes them inactive, or was something that, that made them inactive that gave them, you know, wanted to give them screen time? And finally, parents are reluctant to let their kids out of the house for fear of crime, which is a very sad commentary on our society. And you want to know why kids are fat in the Bayview? That's part of it. Okay, all that's true. But here's the thing. The toxic environment, as Kelly Brownell defines it, is really just a euphemism for our altered behaviors. I'm interested in something way beyond that. What I want to know is, is there something actually toxic, poisonous, a poison that's out there that's causing the obesity epidemic that everyone is exposed to? Everyone. What could that poison be? So can exposure to environmental toxins cause obesity? And actually, there have been several meetings about it. I have to add to this because I just came back from Istanbul where there was another one of these just last week. Okay? So estrogens can do it. Phthalates, which are plasticizers. They're the things that make rubber duckies soft. Organochlorines, which are insecticides. Um, the st state of Iowa is a wash in them. Dioxins and PCBs, organotins, you paint on the bottom of your uh, boat to keep the barnacles from attaching, okay? So they're in our water supply, okay? Or something more relevant to the whole world, something in our diet. And that's what we're going to talk about the rest of today, okay? Not to belittle these, but I want to talk about the big kahuna with you, okay? What would that big kahuna be? All right, so let's see what we're eating. 275 calories in Team Boys. What are they? Are they fat? Five grams, 45 calories, it's a wash. 
When you look at the trends in specific food intake, here are the fats in purple. Milk, way down. Red meat, about the same, everything, you know, cheese here a little up. Bottom line, it's a wash, and that's what the data shows. We're not eating more fat. We are eating more carbohydrate. Here's the carbohydrates down here. Through the friggin' roof. That's what we're eating. Okay? And in fact, as our percent calories from fat went from 40% down to 30%, because we were told to, we were remanded to by the USDA, the AHA, the AMA, back in the early 80s, everybody remember the low-fat directive, right? So we did it. As a percent of total caloric intake, we've gone from 40 to 30%, just like they told us. We have succeeded. And look what happened. Okay? This was not the right thing to do. We screwed up, but good. Okay? Doctors screwed up. Okay? The whole food industry screwed up. And the question is, when you screw up, what do you do? You admit the mistake, and you right the ship. We haven't admitted the mistake, and we haven't righted the ship. And it continues, and it goes on. Now, just yesterday, maybe, was the first admission of guilt by the USDA, because they got rid of the food pyramid yesterday. Okay? And I'm very pleased to say that they replaced it with something called the plate model. Anybody see it? Okay? So it's basically half of the plate is fruits and vegetables, one quarter of the plate is the starch, and one quarter of the plate is the protein, right? We have been doing this in our clinic. Andrea Garber devised this eight years ago, and we've been doing it. So we were state-of-the-art, and we are state-of-the-art. The only thing I don't know is whether the USDA got it from us. But I'll take credit, because it's our plate model. Okay? So I am very happy. Okay. So carbohydrate intake. Okay, there it is right there. That's, what, that's what's changed. Okay? And specifically, what carbohydrate? Well, beverages, right? 41% increase in soft drinks, 35% increase in fruit drinks, fruit aids, okay? Those of you who do obesity uh, care, you know, the first law says one can of soda a day is 150 calories, multiply by 365 days a year, divide by 3,500 calories in a pound. That's worth 15 and a half pounds of fat per year. And our kids aren't drinking one soda, they're drinking four. So there you say, well, because that's, that's what it is, right? Empty calories, contributing to obesity, Therefore, just stop drinking soda. Well, definitely stop drinking soda, but it goes way beyond that. So what is this stuff? All right, so here in America, it's the stuff called high fructose corn syrup, right? Everybody knows that. 63 pounds per year, the most demonized additive known to man. I am not a fan of this stuff. But if you think somehow that this is about high fructose corn syrup, you got another thing coming, because the entire Pacific Rim has no high fructose corn syrup, and they got just as much of a problem as we do. This is not about high fructose corn syrup. Okay, the corn refiners say it's corn sugar. It metabolizes the same as regular sugar. They're right. It does. It is. I don't care that it's corn sugar or high fructose corn syrup. It's irrelevant. It's still bad, and so is the regular white stuff you put in your coffee and tea. They're all the same. Okay? Because here's high fructose corn syrup right here. One glucose, one fructose. Everybody heard of fructose? Okay. Six-membered ring, five-membered ring. This will come back to haunt you later. Sucrose, here's table sugar, white sugar, cane sugar, beet sugar. One glucose, one fructose. Ether linkage combining the two. That's the big difference. Okay. But you have an enzyme in your intestine called sucrase, which breaks this bond in about a nanosecond. And then you absorb the two sugars separately anyway. So this is a wash. It's irrelevant. All the studies that have been done comparing high fructose corn syrup to sucrose show that they're equivalent. I agree. They're equivalently bad. And I'm going to show you why quickly. So I call this slide very specifically the Coca-Cola conspiracy. It's all right. It's on the YouTube. So Coke, anybody here work for Coke? <laughs> Pepsi? OK. All right. All right, so here's the original bottle of Coca-Cola from 1915, standardized out of Atlanta, six and a half ounces. If you drank every one, one of those every day for a year, that would be worth eight pounds of fat per year, provided, of course, that the formula hasn't changed. And we know it has changed because it used to be sucrose and now it's high fructose corn syrup. That was New Coke. Everybody remember 1985? So they, and we revolted and they went back to Coke Classic, 
Remember that? Well, guess what? It's New Coke. We, they just didn't change the name. Over here, 1960, we got the, uh, oh, sorry, uh, 1955, with the advent of, um, uh, with the uh, uh, repeal of the uh, rationing of sugar after World War II, we got the 10 ounce bottle here, first one in vending machines. Over here, we have the 12 ounce uh, can from 1960, that would be worth 16 pounds of fat per year. And her, currently here, of course, is the single unit of measure. Anybody know how many servings you get out of that? 2.58 ounce servings. That's what it says on the bottle. 2.58 ounce servings. Anybody know anybody who gets 2.58 ounce servings out of that? That's a single serving today. Okay, so that's worth 26 pounds of fat per year. And over here we have the the 7-Eleven, uh, um, you know, uh, Big K, Thirst Buster, Big Gulp, you know, whatever you want to call it, 44 ounces, 57 pounds of, of fat per year. And, of course, in Texas, they have a Texas-sized Big Gulp. 60 ounces of Coca-Cola, a Snickers bar, and a bag of Doritos, all for 99 cents. Okay, you get the picture, right? So why do I call it the Coca-Cola conspiracy? Well, what's in Coke? Caffeine. So caffeine, it's a diuretic. It's a, it's a little bit of a stimulant, but it's a diuretic, right? It causes you to urinate free water. What else is in Coke? Salt, 55 milligrams per can. So what happens if you take on salt and you lose free water? You get Thirsty. thirstier, right? So why is there so much sugar in Coke? Hide the salt, right? There are five tastes on your tongue. There's sweet. Then there's sour, bitter, um, uh, salty, and umami, this uh, astringent, you know, like soy sauce, okay? Sugar covers up the other four. So, like salty, Chex Mix, honey roasted peanuts, okay? Um, uh, sour, uh, sweet and sour pork, you know, vinegar, okay? Um, uma I mean, actually, that was um umami, the sweet and sour pork, okay? Um, the uh, uh, sour, is uh, like, for instance, um, you know, the tomato, putting in the tomato sauce, and get, uh, or the Swiss Reserve in German wine. Uh, 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 what was the last one? I'm missing one. What was the last one? Bitter, bitter. Milk chocolate, right? Caffeine is bitter, right? Dark chocolate's a little bitter. Okay, milk chocolate, very sweet. So bottom line, you can make dog poop taste good with enough sugar. And indeed, that's what the food industry has done because you can cover up all the negative aspects of any given food by adding sugar. And they have done it, and they have learned in the process that when they do it, we buy more. So it has found its way into everything. It's found its way into tomato sauces, barbecue sauce, salad dressing, um, hamburger buns, hamburger meat, chicken, you name it, okay? Somebody told me recently that the french fries at McDonald's are dipped in a water solution before they're fried because it actually browns the french fries better. I don't know if it's true or not. I haven't necessarily seen it, but I was told that. So um, I, 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 huh? Sugar water. Sugar water, yeah. Okay. All right, I love this. So here are the 10 most obese states. This is not a surprise to any of you, I'm sure. Okay, here are the 10 laziest states. I wonder what's going on over here in Nevada. <laughs> Okay? I was going to say, you know, there's only so much energy you, you know, expend doing this. Okay? Well, here's the adult diabetes rate. Okay? And here's the soda per capita. Hmm. Is this shocking? Now, this is correlation, not causation. We don't know. I mean, maybe obese, lazy people drink soda. Or maybe soda makes you obese and lazy. We don't know. It's just correlation. But it's an interesting one, to say the least. But it's not just us, because here's the world. So here's world sugar consumption. 1960, 50 million tons, up to 150 million tons. They've tripled over the uh, past 50 years. And look at this, Brazil, okay? Brazil now has the highest increase in prevalence in obesity and type 2 diabetes in terms of rate of increase, okay? They also happen to manufacture sugar. So it's cheaper there. Okay? And here's the prevalence of diabetes in 2010. Remember Malaysia, I told you, right there? There it is, right there. Okay? And Saudi Arabia, absolutely off the wall, off the scale. Okay? And they don't have high fructose corn syrup there. So here's the secular trend in fructose consumption in America. When we got our fructose out of the ground, eating fruits and vegetables, 
our ancestors 100 years ago, we got about 15 grams a day in fructose, so double that for sugar. Prior to World War II, with the advent of the nascent candy and uh, soft drink industry, we got up to about 20 grams. By 1977, before the advent of high fructose corn syrup on our shores, we were up to 37 grams a day, which was 8% of our total caloric intake. By 1994, we were up to 55 grams a day, or 10% of our total caloric intake. And currently, adolescents are up to 75, or 12% of total caloric intake. 25% of adolescents are up to 100 grams of fructose per day, double that for sugar. So that's 200 grams of sugar, multiply that by 4.1 calories per gram, and you can see that the 40% of their total caloric allotment is in sugar. This is a disaster. So not only are we consuming more, yes we are, we're consuming more fructose, and we're consuming more fructose as a percent of our total percent calories, every, uh, total calories. Everybody got it? So this is what's really changed. So you want to talk about what's changed, this is what's changed. So. This just says, new data not so sour on corn syrup. This was uh, in response to an American Journal of Clinical Nutrition supplement where they had 11 articles all comparing high fructose corn syrup to sucrose showing absolutely no difference. And of course, the corn refiners touting that and saying that this was a good thing. Okay. This came from Gavin Newsom. Okay. Uh, uh, remember, he floated this first soda tax. So here's Center for the Science and the Public Interest in the Corn Refiners Association responding to Gavin immediately the day after he first floated that soda tax three years ago. We respectfully urge that the proposal be revised as soon as possible to reflect the scientific evidence that demonstrates no material differences in the health effects of high fructose corn syrup and sugar. Indeed. Here's the important statement. The real issue is that excessive consumption of any sugars may lead to health problems. They wrote it. I didn't even say it. They said it. Duh! Like, how dumb do you have to be? So, why are we here? How did we get here? This is the perfect storm from three political winds that blew at exactly the same time to create a tsunami. Okay? Not one person did this. Okay? This is a, basically a, a, uh, uh, what happens you know, when, when things just go off the rails. So the first thing that happened. Johnson started the War of Poverty. Nixon finished it. Okay? He told his secretary Earl, uh, of Agriculture, Earl Rusty Butts, that food should never be an issue in a presidential election. Get food off the table. And I'll show you in a minute why he said that. Okay? He knew that food was a problem. Indeed, we know that food is a problem. Because remember, two years ago, we decided to try um, moving the, the, the uh, corn syrup, you know, the, the corn refiners decided to make ethanol to see if we could power our cars out of that. That caused the rice riots in Thailand that led to the overthrow of that government. So we are so globally connected now that we can't even change something and have normal stability in the rest of the world, which is another reason why the government's paralyzed. Okay, that's one. So look at this. This is really important. Maybe the most important slide I'll show you today. This came from Time Magazine just about two months ago, and it's called Hungry World. It's the percent of gross national product spent on food by country. Take a look. We spend the least, 7%. Okay, Britain, 9. Australia, 10. We are the most obese countries. Take a look at the ones that are in purple. Okay, notice they're all in revolution today. More than 35% of the, their money spent on food. That's why they're in revolution. High food prices create political unrest. Indeed it does. And one of the reasons that we are still the United States of America and haven't basically revolted is because food is cheap. Karl Marx said religion is the opiate of the people. Karl Marx never met McDonald's. Okay? This is very important for you to understand. Okay? Because this is why lower SES people seem happy with their fast food. Second, the advent of high fructose corn syrup, invented in 1966 in Japan, Takasaki at Saga Medical School in Japan, introduced the American market in 1975. And here's what happened. So here's the producer price, the U.S. producer price index of sugar. You want it to be at 100, because at 100, basically you've got price stability. So if it goes down, that means it's cheaper. If it goes up, that means it's more expensive. Okay, everybody got it? 
So look what happened prior to 1975. Bingo, bingo. Nixon knew this. This is why he told Butts to do what he did. 